last week of a series on the prayer of God, the seven supplications of the Son of God. And it is, it, it's been a blast to go week by week unpacking the Lord's Prayer. So I can't think of a better way to end the last, or to begin the end, by reciting the prayer. Say it with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You can sit down. We're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 4, today. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to pull that out. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up here. Um, If I see you looking down at your phone, I'm going to be, it's assuming that it's not because you're playing Angry Birds, but it's because you have the Bible app on your phone. If you are playing Angry Birds, just don't tell me. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. Um, Today, we're, we're taking these last two phrases of the prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're putting these two parts of the prayer, these last two supplications together. The reason being is because we had a hurricane last week. And so, yeah, that means that we were going to take these two apart and now we're putting them together. But I'm actually quite excited that in the providence of God it worked out this way. Because as I've been praying for you and studying for this... I actually think that they're two sides of the same coin. Turning away from evil and pursuing the kingdom power and glory of God are two sides of the same coin, and the coin we'll call holiness. Holiness. I'm sure you woke up this morning and you were like, I hope someone talks about holiness. Love it when we talk about sin, evil, temptation, and holiness. These are like the fun topics that everyone comes to church to hear, right? It's, it's whole, how, how can the bad things go away? Talk to me about that pastor. Like that, tell me, tell me that message. Well, you're welcome. That's where we're going today. Uh, in, in order to do that, we're going to need God's help. So I'm going to pray and we're going to get to work. Father, in Jesus name, I'm asking you, uh, for help. This morning, I thank you for the promise of your word that says that when we open the Bible and when we teach from the scriptures, you would send the Holy Spirit to illuminate it, to make it present. I thank you that you're not just a far off God who chucks your words at us and says, you know, do your best. But you're you're the God who's given us your word and then given us the spirit. You're present here with us to illuminate it. So illuminate it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Holiness. Today's topic is um, going to be a little bit different. See, there's a pressure when you preach. Uh, there's, there's this pressure to make everything that I say from behind or, well, beside this pulpit, music stand, uh, to, to make everything that's said from up here immediately practical right now to some moment of your life right here, right now. In fact, it, it's, such, it, it's such a hard pressure that every, literally every book I've ever read about preaching and every sermon I've ever heard on giving sermons and every lecture I've heard about the topic of sermon, they're all about the idea that at the end of the day, you've got to take that thing home and make it immediately practical. And it makes sense, right? Like, who wants to sit around and, and listen to some guy bloviate for a couple of hours about something that has nothing to do with real life? I mean, you... you well, most of you do that because you go to college. Ah. And just think, I don't charge you 40 grand a year, so we got that going. Already a reason some of you looked at me rather bitterly about that fact. That like, oh, I just reminded you of a negative thing. Don't worry. Uh, just fill your mind with something else. But of course, who wants to sit and just listen to something that's totally detached from real life? And yet today's topic is not one of those things where I can say, all right, so because but here's holiness. So here, here are your five techniques that all happen to start with the same letter on how you're going to be holy. Here's the song about holiness. Here's the website about holiness. Here's the Bible study about you being holy, such that if you activate on all five of these action points, if you do the seven D's, if you take the three steps or whatever it is, then you'll actually be Holy. I think part of our desire to make everything immediately practical is because we live in a very meistic society. Our great American theologian, Oprah, <laughs> takes, takes us to the next level because it's always about the next book or the next thing or the next technique to make our lives a little better. And yet today, even though the topic of holiness is not, as I will preach it to you, immediately applicable to these three steps of your life, it is perennially relevant. 
It's not one of those things that I can say, do these three things so you'll be holier. It's one of these things that if you get it, if you leave here, having gotten what God wants to teach us from his word today, it won't be practical to one, two, or three things. It will actually change everything. It will actually change everything. This will not be a sermon today where I tell you the three easy steps to being holy. This is going to be a sermon today where I tell you about Jesus, the author and the enabler of holiness. As we examine this last two-sided part of this prayer, lead us away from temptation and evil because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, holiness. I told you this isn't a topic that that many of us want to, uh, to preach on, but my daughters... I have two of them, and they're awesome. And, and every night uh, that I'm home, when I put them to bed, we have something called special time, where I take one of them, and we read the Bible, and we pray, and we talk about their day, and they can ask me questions, and, and we just we hang out for about 10 or 15 minutes. But any of you that have met my daughters know that they're crazy. They're crazy. Like, nuttier than a Snickers bar, crazy, right? Like, and some of you are like, I babysat for them. I know, they're crazy. Um, and then some of you made the mistake of giving them dessert when you did it. I'm looking at you. Yes, yes, we don't pay you enough, my dear. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it, they're crazy. And so the crazy got ported into special time, which was annoying. Now, I like being silly. I like to get rowdy with my kids, but not all the time, okay? Not all all the time. And so I'm, I was struggling to help them understand, like, okay, this moment right here, we love being silly, we love being crazy, but this moment right here is holy. This moment right here is unique. This moment right here is special. And so I was thinking about, okay, how do I get them to understand holy? Holy means set apart. It means other. It means transcendent. It means not normal in the good way. And so as I was grasping for words, the best word that I could come up with for their six- and four-year-old minds to wrap around was the word special. Special. Totally unique. Totally set apart. This moment is different. Special is a key word in the Mabry house because if we say special, then my children immediately know, ooh, we're about to do or get or, or go on something that isn't normal. So it's usually like special movie or special dessert or special trip or special. So whatever follows special, my kids are already like, oh, okay, what are we doing? Special, uh, and they're ready. God and time with God and being like God and pursuing God is special. It's special. This concept of holiness that I'm struggling to teach my children is exactly what I wish to teach you today. It's exactly what I wish to teach you today. Now, as we talk about holiness, I can already think and imagine a couple of, a couple of, ugh, Reactions. I know where we are, right? We're, we're in Cambridge. We're right in between Harvard and MIT. We're surrounded by some of the smartest people in the world. Some of you are. And so when we talk about ideas of like holiness, sin, evil, uh, I, can, I can kind of feel the reaction of going, okay, Pastor Adam, these, these words, we don't, these, are, these are old words. We don't want to talk about that. Uh, let, let's, let's just say, you know, we, we, we'd rather say we're here to talk about common human flourishing and positive life patterns and negative life patterns, but let's not call things evil and, make, and use the word holy because those concepts have been used to chop up people into little groups and pit them against one another over time. And we live in a very progressive, quite advanced, multicultural, multi-ethnic society and, and chopping people up into groups of holy and not holy and righteous and unrighteous and evil and tempters and the tempted and uh, we don't. Let's, let's not do that. Let's not do that. I, I, I get that. There, there are a couple of things I would say in response to that idea. The first is, you're right. The idea of holiness and the idea of evil and the idea of goodness have absolutely been used in the past to segregate, to divide, to push people apart, to, to make us religious types, us very, you know, holy men. Good thing my wife is here because so she <laughs> pulled me back down out of the clouds. To make us somehow better, different, specialer than others. And we react against that, don't we? We look at that and we go, no. No, we don't want any part of that. We don't want to be a part of a society that pushes people apart. And if that's what church is and if that's what following God is about, no thanks. And you're right. If the concept of holiness is used in that way, yeah, that's, that's wrong. And it definitely has been. 
But I would also say that just because the concept has been used badly doesn't mean the concept is bad. Those two things don't follow. Just because people have used language of holiness and sin and temptation and evil wrongly doesn't mean that the concepts are wrong. If anything, in fact, I think it shows them to be true. Because in abusing these concepts, don't... And when we react against them and go, oh, that's wrong, that's evil. Wait, there we are. In judging the wrong use of the concept, haven't we simply demonstrated that it's there? In bristling against people who go, okay, you're holy and you're unholy and you're righteous and you're unrighteous. When we react against that and we say, that's wrong. Well, you're right, it is wrong. Now who's talking in religious moral categories? See, I don't think our problem with holiness is the fact that we think it's old or outdated or, or that it's not there. I think our problem with holiness is that we've seen people who've tried to be holy. We've seen religious people and movements say that they've got the five easy steps, the three easy keys, the seminary to go to or the Bible study to attend to get people to be holy. And then when we draw near to them, we've seen behind the veil that actually they've got some issues too. I think that's probably our problem with holiness. Which is, again, why today, I'm not going to give you the three easy steps. I'm going to tell you why Jesus is the hero of holiness. And he's the one who enables your holiness. Let's go Luke 4. 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were done, when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it isn't written, man shall not live by bread alone. And then the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And he, the devil, took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put your Lord, the, God, the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil ended every temptation, he departed from him for a more opportune time. And Jesus returned in the power of of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went all throughout the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. I told you that today we're going to see how holiness and the pursuit of holiness is actually two sides of this coin that that the Lord's Prayer presents us with. Lead us away from temptation and evil, and yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So first... Temptation. When we jump here in the story, we see that, uh, that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, just to put you in the timeline here, Jesus had just been baptized by John. The Holy Spirit had descended on him like a dove. The three members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, showed up. And God the Father spoke from heaven, this is my son. Listen to him. you got to know, that's a good day at church, okay? When God the Father booms his voice in the big ugly gym, that's how you know we've had a win on Sunday. Just throwing that out there. So, Jesus has had a really good moment. And so now, being full of the Holy Spirit and being led, the Son of God, being led by the Spirit of God, is drawn out into the desert. Why? To be tempted. No, wait, but hold on. Lead us not into temptation. And then you you led him into temptation. Do you ever have a moment when you read your Bible and you're like, what? (laughs) What? But I thought, and then you're saying, and how does this work together? As I was st- studying this, uh, this material for you this week, I found that there are actually a lot of Ph.D. guys with big, long resumes and lots and lots of uh, books published that do a really poor job with this. This is basically some of their contention, which I will throw thoroughly under the bus for you, and we will watch as the bus piles over this idea because it's a bad idea. And we have a rule in my house about bad ideas. If you have one, don't say it. Because if you say it, 
we reserve the right to make fun of it. That's how it rolls in the Mabry house. And I think it's a good rule. Don't you, dear? Um, it's unfortunate that I'm the one with the bad ideas. But whatever. It was my idea. Maybe that was a bad idea. Moving on. Um, so th- this idea that somehow God is uh, crouching behind the bush, you know, waiting on you. And when you walk by, he sticks his leg out and gets you. Some of you think God is like that. Some of you, you, you don't have like a Bible verse for it, but this is kind of how you've practically approached your faith. And so when God the Son here teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation, what we're really asking is, Lord, hey, I know you're kind of, you know, you're, you're tricky, you're tricky, and I don't know where you are, so if I pray really, really hard and really, really earnestly, you won't mess with me. And so we pray really hard, lead us not into temptation, don't just don't lead me into temptation, don't let me be tempted. And then he goes, well, okay, she said it 15 times, so I guess, you know, she did have a really long time in the Bible this week, so, all right, fine. And he goes off and gets some other unwitting Christian nonsense. The power of life and death is in prepositions, you should know. See, Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. So I started on a little Bible study this week. Of every time that phrase, into temptation, shows up, what in the world does it mean? Every single time it shows up, it actually means entering into the thing with which you are tempted. There's a difference, and you need to know this, between being presented with temptation and entering into it. Big difference. Big difference between being presented with the temptation to do evil, to do wrong, to turn your back on God if you are a man or woman of God, or even if you're not yet there where you would describe yourself that way, you know what temptation is like. Some of y'all trying to lose five pounds. Every time you see a piece of chocolate, temptation. I thought that would be funnier. Some of you are like now a little concerned. Don't worry. Temptation. It can't mean when we pray, lead us not into temptation, Lord, keep all temptation from us. It can't mean that. In fact, we know it can't mean that because, good grief, Jesus was led, the Son of God was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness for the express purpose of being tempted. So what's the deal? The scriptures say very clearly that God doesn't tempt any man. How does this all fit together? Well, there's a big difference between being presented with a temptation and going into it. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation, what we're praying is, Lord, be so in charge of our lives. Lead us, lead me in such a way that I won't actually walk into the thing that presents itself as so attractive. I have a buddy who says, uh, you can't keep the birds from landing on your head, but you can keep them from building a nest. You can't help the weird thoughts that fly through your mind. And some of you Christians have been so bound up and worried that you're tempted to do all sorts of crazy things, say all sorts of crazy things, hear all kinds of crazy things, act out on all kinds of crazy things, and you're praying, lead me not into temptation as though the Lord would take the temptation away. The answer to the prayer, lead me not into temptation, is not that temptation goes away, it's that you don't go into it. In fact, it seems the holier you become, the more tempted you shall be. There's a correlation. Because Jesus wasn't having a bad day. Dr. Luke goes out of his way to say that he was full of the Holy Spirit. He's pursuing God and his purposes and his kingdom and his power and his glory. And that's where he meets temptation. Kind of makes sense. If your life is a wreck, the devil probably doesn't need to help you wreck it. You know, he probably doesn't need to tempt you. He's probably like, uh, no, you're doing fine. (laughs) Thought about recruiting that guy, actually, yeah. So good at tempting himself. Lead us not into temptation means, God, lead me in such a way that as temptation comes, I follow you and I don't enter into it. That's the answer to that prayer. Notice that Jesus was pursuing God. Now, I want to tell you this. Uh, there are, uh, we'll just briefly fly through this part. There are three sources of temptation, and I thought about not mentioning this to you, but I wanted to, wanted to throw this out to you. The Puritans brought up three different sources of temptation, the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'll say them again, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they're important because some of you are super unspiritual, some of you are hyper-spiritual, and knowing these three things are, is going to help you from disbelieving in the existence of supernatural evil forces and the extreme of finding them everywhere. 
The world, the flesh, and the devil. The first thing we'll talk about is the flesh, because Jesus was tempted in this way. Hey, uh, I love the understatement of the book of Luke. He had fasted for 40 days, and he was hungry. Thank you, Dr. Luke. Wow, I would not have been able to guess that unless you put that in there. Was Jesus hungry? Really? Really? Some of you guys, you can't even miss a meal without looking like you've crawled through the Sahara. Okay, 40 days, no food in the desert. Are you with me here? All right. That, yes, my man was hungry. And you need to see that to know that when the devil came to him and said, Hey, you're hungry. Well, you're the son of God. Turn these into bread. Some of you have stained glass Jesus as, your, as the picture that you carry around. Stained glass, pretty hair, white Jesus with sheep and a staff doing this for some reason with the ah all the time. And so when stained glass Jesus is what exists in your mind, then you, you read passages like this and you go, oh yeah, Jesus was tempted, right? You know, okay, th- you know, thank you, Jesus, for looking tempted. We appreciate that. So you know it's kind of what it's kind of like. No, 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 no. This isn't stained glass Jesus. Fully God, fully man, hadn't eaten for 40 days. Hungry doesn't even begin to describe the desire of his flesh for food. Some of you are studying medicine. You don't eat for 40 days. You're keenly aware of what the body starts to do to itself. It eats itself. And here's Jesus presented with the opportunity to to engage in a good thing. Hey, God made the body for food. Food, Food's not a bad thing, right? Just just satisfy your flesh. Hey, you know what? Sex is, God made sex. You know, and you you know what? You got needs. You have needs. God God made your body. He knew what he was doing. So, you know, just, just do whatever you have to do to meet your need. Men, you know, it's okay. You can, you can treat women, you know, as objects. It's fine. You know, you have needs. Ladies, you can give away your bodies because you have them. You've got needs. But Jesus says, men shall not live by bread alone, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus remembered the book of Psalms where he said, your word is more precious to me than gold. It is sweeter on the lips than honey, fresh honey from the honeycomb. He remembered. And he said, No. He had in his mind and in his heart an affection for something greater than bread at the price of disobedience. The flesh. Your flesh cries out to tempt you enough. The devil doesn't have to necessarily bother you with that. Then the world. What does he also tempt Jesus with? Power. Hey, you know what? You know, you, you, you don't need to do all that cross, dying, walking around with 12 stupid men for three and a half years. You don't need to do that. You just skip all that part. You bow down to me. I'll give you the keys to this thing. You bolt up back to heaven. We'll be fine. Some of you, actually many of you, if you're here and you're studying, you're probably near or at the top of your field. Which means when you're done here, you will go and lead something. Which means you'll be given power and responsibility. And you will have at that moment an opportunity to abuse it. You will have at that moment an opportunity to be tempted by it in such a way as to satisfy yourself in the world more than in God. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. It's better to do things God's way. The world, the flesh, and then finally, the devil. This was pretty easy. Because good grief, it was the devil who mentioned all of this stuff to him. But some of you are so hyper-spiritual... You think that every time that something bad happens to you or you feel a temptation, it's because God, or or that that the devil has come, the devil or a devil has come, and, and, and he's just got your number, man, and he is assigned to just ruin your life. Quit flattering yourself. His resources are limited. You're not that big of a deal, okay? Calm down. Jesus got the devil. You might get a devil sometimes, okay? But honestly... You're probably so well-skilled at tempting and falling into temptation yourself, he might not even need to help you much. Now, to be sure, there's a devil, a real, personal, fallen angel who hates God and hates God's people. Let that rest assured in your minds. The scriptures teach that very clearly. But that doesn't mean that he's the cause of everything bad you do. It is a convenient psychobabble spiritual way of making you not responsible for anything, though. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, so there we are. There it is. See, see, as long as... Just be like Jesus. 
Just be like, as long as you just have enough willpower, as long as you just remember God's word enough, you go to enough Bible studies, you got the Christian music in your ears, you've just had Christian food from Chick-fil-A or something, you're going to church, you know, and like you, as long as you're just Christian-y enough, let me find. Just white knuckle that, that stuff, man. Just resist, resist. Don't the scriptures say resist the devil and he'll flee from you? Yeah. Yeah, they do. But you've got to see how Jesus did that to know how you can do it. And before you can do it, he not only has to show you how, he has to transform you to enable you to do it in the first place. If we stop the prayer here, it might not be that good of news. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Why? 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 Why not? Do you know why you fall into temptation? You ready for this? This is profound. Because you want to. Do you know why you do what you ought not do? Because you want to. Now, I realize that there are some sin patterns, and, you know, know, I'm not throwing, you know, genetic predisposition or bad, you know, environment or anything. I'm not throwing any of that away. I realize that. But at bottom, we view the things that tear our lives apart as somehow valuable, more valuable even than God and himself and his word and what he says about us. And so the way we resist temptation is by coming to the other side of this prayer. The way we pursue holiness is not merely by resisting evil. The way we pursue holiness is by remembering and exalting in the fact that his is the kingdom, his is the power, his is the glory forever. Forever. The value of his kingdom, power, glory, worth, and satisfaction is a forever value. It's an infinite modifier on his awesomeness. And so I don't resist temptations to sin by going, no, don't sin, no, don't sin, don't sin, no, no, no. That's not how I do it. Putting a little rubber band and popping myself every time. The way I resist temptation is the same way Jesus resisted temptation, which is to be so satisfied in God that you lose taste for that. How do I know that's true? Well, verse 14, I think, helps. All the temptation was done. And, uh, and, and the good people of the ESV decided to put a header here. But the header isn't actually there in the inspired, infallible text. That's just to help us. But I actually think it goes quite nicely to keep on reading because it says, okay, temptation over. So what was he pursuing? Where was he going such that the temptation seemed weak sauce to him? Well, he was going, returning in power of the spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And receiving the glory of all, he was participating in the mission of God, receiving the glory of God. Oh, you don't resist temptation by sitting idly and going, don't, don't, just don't, just, just don't. Hey, you call me. We'll start a group. We'll start a little accountability group and we'll ask each other awkward questions. Make sure you, we don't. And, uh, you know, dollar in the jar every time you do. But don't. That's not the gospel. Anybody can do that. And it doesn't work. Because even if you do manage to modify your behavior in such a way that you resist the thing, well, then who looks good? You. Then who gets the glory? You. And then when you meet someone who struggles with that same issue, that same temptation, that same lie, you come to them and you say, well, I could do it. What's wrong with you? That doesn't sound like the gospel. That sounds like human pride. So how, how do we... How how do we get to the answer of the prayer? How do we pursue holiness? How do we flee temptation and pursue God? Well, we do it by seeing how Jesus did it. And by believing in faith, he can do it through us. By believing in faith that he can do it through us. After the temptation and Jesus not entering it, but resisting it, he left full of power. He passed the test. You know what's the nice thing about temptation when you walk through it? You see what's in your heart. You see, God, I I still have a desire for for the, the things that are less than you. Get that out. So satisfy me in you that I won't satiate my desire for lesser things on lesser things. That I would be consumed with the kingdom and the power and the glory of God forever. Amen. The way we flee temptation, the way we pursue holiness is by having our mind absolutely blown by the awesomeness of God. 
I don't have a better way to help you. The best thing that I, the best news I can give you is not merely that Jesus demonstrates how to flee temptation and be holy. The best news that I have for you is that not only does he demonstrate it, but he himself becomes the answer to the prayer that he commands you and I to pray. By winning for us a victory over those things such that by faith in him, we can resist those things too. Because now, now for the first time, because sin has been conquered, death has been defeated, we can taste and see that the Lord is good and he's better than those things. He's better than the negative life patterns. He's better than the lust. He's better than the drugs. He's better than the abuse. He's better than the negative self-talk. He's better than the endless cul-de-sac of bad relationships you keep putting yourself on. Whatever your sin, whatever your issue is, whatever your little pet problem is, he's better. He's better. Thomas Chalmers, a 19th century Scottish theologian, talked about this when he said, he coined the phrase, the expulsive power of a new affection. I love that. The expulsive power of a new affection. You don't resist sin and pursue holiness by going, don't, don't, just don't, just don't, don't sin. Just, you know, been taping enough Bible verses on your, you know, in your car, on your computer screen, or writing them on your arms or something. That's not how you do it. You get a taste for something better. Let me tell you, when I got married, and my beautiful wife started cooking for me, and making my life so much better, Do you know that the temptation to eat cruddy food was gone? (laughs) It was gone immediately. Poof. I no longer really care that I don't get to eat Wendy's a couple of times a week. You know why? I have something better. Thank you very much. Wendy's fine. You're on the road. Whatever. But eh, it's all right. Ah, go out to eat. Mm, Or enjoy this amazing thing that my wife makes for our family. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's all right. Thanks for that, sweetie. It's better. God's better. And when you taste and see that he's better, temptation seems a cheap imitation. It seems a cheap imitation. So, therefore, be holy, right? No. Jesus not only teaches us what to pray and demonstrates how to be holy, but he himself is the answer to our prayer. He doesn't merely command our holiness. He demonstrates it and then enables it. That's the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel isn't just that you got your uh, get-out-of-hell-free card punched, and so, you know, go off and toddle off now and, you know, go to church if you want. The good news of the gospel is that you can be absolutely transformed. Some of you, you're Christians, or you're, you've been around religious stuff for a while, and you think, you actually still manage to think that by being holy, you'll get God to like you. If you're good enough, smart enough, gosh darn it, He'll like you. If you try harder, do better. If you do the three Ds, read the book, go to the Bible study, do the thing, then you just paint a big red target on yourself for him to bless you. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you can't possibly obey this command. But Jesus could. Jesus has. And through you, Jesus can That's the gospel. The gospel isn't be holy so God will love you. The gospel is God has loved you and purchased your holiness. So now you can be holy. One is not the same as the other. One is not the same as the other. Some of you, you find yourself tempted by such horrible besetting sins that you you find it almost impossible to bear. I understand that. I understand that. I, I... I I myself have gone through seasons of really just dark temptation where I'm just praying, God, don't let me enter into that thing. But when you're in those moments, you're not demonstrating that holiness is impossible. What you're demonstrating is that you, in your brokenness and in your lack of your ability to resist, you are a perfect candidate for the grace of the gospel. When you get to the end of your rope to resist, that's precisely when you're ready to get some grace. When you still think you got it, God will go, okay, good luck with that. No, 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 you, you got this. But when you're finally at the end of your own efforts, you achievers, you top of your class, you best in your field, 
you Harvard, MIT, Emerson, BU, BC, Tufts, Wellesley students. You are candidates most of all for falling into the temptation to think that you can actually do this because you're great. Your greatness is meaningless here. There is one greater than you who's overcome the thing that stands against you. And by faith in him, through you, he'll overcome it too. And that's the good news of the gospel. So here's the big therefore. We're going to take um, communion today. We're going to remember the body and the blood of Jesus because holiness, resisting temptation, and being free to pursue the kingdom power and glory of God only comes by the shed body and blood of Christ. And so if you're a Christian in here today, what I want to invite you to do is as we enter into a time of worship when we're done and we start singing and the band comes back up and we worship, I want to invite you to remember. I want to to remember. Some of you, you're you're here and you're, you're in proximity to church, but you're not yet to the place where you could identify yourself as one who's been wrecked by the kingdom power and glory of God. You're interested, but you're, you're not sure if you're good enough. And what I'm here to tell you is you're not. But neither am I, and neither is anyone else sitting near you. You are a perfect candidate for the grace of God. And so today could actually be the day where for the first time you lay down your arms, you put down your effort, and you stop trying so hard. And you become free to enjoy the glory of God. So let me ask you to stand. I want to pray for you. Then we're going to enter into this time of worship and communion.